Yeah. See that okay? Um, yeah, so basically I'm, I thought I would just uh, sort of go over a bit of what my career has been so far um, and then sort of my perspective on why I think PhDs are valued in industry um, and some advantages of why personally I think you should go into industry rather than um, academia. Um, so yeah, my photonics career so far, um, I did a, a bachelor's in physics at Harriet Watt. Um, I actually originally joined the physics, the teaching course um, for changing in um, my second year. Um, I didn't really know what careers were, were out there um, and thought teaching was one of the only physics options really. So that's why I'd stuck with that before realizing that wasn't for me and that I most definitely preferred the experimental side of things. Um, so thankfully changed um, and stayed on. And then um, after my um, bachelor's, uh, one of the professors that um, I actually did my bachelor's project was, was Ajoy Carr, and he was in charge with, of the MSc um, for Photonics and Optical Electronic Devices. Um, which is run by Harriet Watt and St Andrews. So he was um, quite an influence in, for me actually going to do that course. Lasers and photonics was also always the bit that um, I enjoyed most out of the um, sort of different experiments and different things that you learn about in an undergrad. Um, so I wanted to pursue that a bit more and that in depth master's course really appealed to me, especially because it included a, a three month industrial placement as well, uh, which I uh, took part in, in in Leonardo in Edinburgh in their lasers department, quite similar place to where I currently work. Uh, so after that, I went back to Harriet Watt and uh, completed a PhD also with Ajoy Carr um, and Henry Buki, who is now at uh, Fraunhofer, he was um, also sort of supervising me in that project, which was on integrated multi-core fibre devices for optical trapping. That actually wasn't what my topic was meant to be. I spent the first year working also on multiple fibres, but doped fibres to produce um, a multi-coloured laser. Uh, unfortunately, that project didn't go well. The, the fibre quality wasn't that great and we didn't have time to procure more. So we sort of rummaged around the lab and my actual topic was born from what we could find really. And um, I'll go a bit on to what my PhD was after this. But basically after that, I, um, I wasn't I wasn't really wanting to go into a postdoc, um, especially all the ones that were kind of around when I was finishing were short term. Um, but I, I was offered uh, the, a postdoc position in um, a separate group at Harriet Watt, which it was a short term one. It was only eight months and um, it was industrial funded and basically everything that needed in this short term contract. It was all quite suited to what I was doing of fibres, interferometry, um, that I kind of couldn't say no. But um, I'm a bit of a warrior when it comes to sort of finance and things like that. So one of the, I kind of was almost straight away still looking for another job when I'd got that as what can I do afterwards? Because eight month contract scared me like nobody's business. So um, during that, the opportunity at, at Talis in Glasgow for a laser engineer came up. It was kind of the sort of role that I was looking for um, after working in Leonardo for my industrial placement. Um, and those sort of positions don't come up very often. So I, I needed to apply and um, didn't expect that I would get it. It was one of the first proper job interviews I did but um, I got it so it ended up I actually only completed five months of the, 
the postdoc position rather than the eighth uh, before I, I joined TALIS. Um, so I basically did all the experimental work and left my supervisor to do the write-up. Um, so uh, I'm, hopefully he's still all right with that now. Um, but yeah, so as I said, my, my PhD was in passive fibres really for um, optical trapping. It sounds more biophotonic, say, so how did I end up laser engineering? It, you know, it doesn't sound right. Um, this slide, I've basically summarised my entire PhD thesis just on one page um, and with each role being a separate experiment. But yes, it, it's passive fibres, but there's a lot more that sort of you can delve into what you do rather than the sort of small end result of what your um, your project entails. So I've, I've put some of the diagrams there. It uses a laser, but there's there is quite a lot of alignment, especially trying to get multiple beams into a small fibre um, and then using cameras, using optics, wave plates, beam splitters, all of these things you have to learn about and, and know how to use them and um, procure them as well, which which is a sort of lot of skills that you accumulate over a PhD or a master's that, um, I mean, you're doing all these things yourself, really. It's not like someone's given you all this or a ready built up experiment that you just go and do. Um, so there's a lot of skills that you pick up. Like it, sort of the purpose of a PhD is to become an expert in a really small area. But that's not, the most, to me personally, that's not the most important part of the PhD experience of, or of what you learn through it. It's, it's all those skills that you pick up along the way that you maybe don't realise, but um, I definitely give you a, an advantage over if you were coming straight out of a uh, um, bachelor's course. Um, so it's kind of, I've got a bit of summarising here of why I personally think having a PhD gives you a, a bit more of a boost going into industry. Um, sort of like, you know, you you have to do all of these things yourself in your PhD. Um, things do go wrong and they will go wrong, but it's, it's how you deal with them and learn from that and um, research, you, you know, you become that sort of expert, but you're, you're doing a lot of looking up, reading, um, sort of sorting out fact from fiction, which is which is really important, especially when it comes to working with teams and in industry of multiple disciplines. You won't be expected to know every single bit of that, but um, you you do pick up a little bit along the way, which is also what you do in a PhD. Um, like you're in charge of your entire experiment, so that can be if if, if you're using something that needs a little bit of a wiring or soldering job or a, a little um, circuit, you'll make that yourself. The same as mechanics, how do you hold things in place? You'll design and even sometimes go to the workshop and drill that out. So there's, there's things there that you pick up just through day-to-day -day life of doing a PhD. Um, along with the sort of presentation skills, going to conferences and speaking in front of people and putting your opinion across as well, really. Um, and also as a bit of a fast learning capability as well. You PhD, people with PhDs that come into industry, you can generally tend to leave them to get on with it on their own. Whereas um, sometimes the case with um, people straight out of bachelors, there's, there's a bit more of a learning curve to, to get up to integrated into the team. Um, so. I mean, this is all personally my speaking, it might be completely wrong, but um, this is what I see as why uh, in having a PhD and going into industry, you are valued above um, coming straight from bachelors. It's not like you sort of lose the, why did I spend four years doing a PhD or three and a half years doing a PhD to then go where you could have been before. It's, I don't see it as that. Um, so. What have I done since I've been at TALIS? So I've, I've worked there for six years now um, as a laser engineer, but I've actually got a couple of different roles under that as well. Um, so when I started, 
I've, I've basically worked on about three products now um, and uh, some R&D stuff outside of that as well. Um, but with the sort of first main product was Micromelt, which is a class one R LRF uh, laser rangefinder. So when I started that, the design had already been done and we'd just bought the sort of first prototypes. So I did a lot of the development testing and um, sort of saw where the met where it met the spec, where it didn't meet the spec, trying to sort of define our data pack and what that meant to then go on to the um, fully sort of um, first customer qualification builds. Uh, and then I was involved in a lot of the qualification of uh, designing the testing and carrying out testing as well. And that unit, uh, that uh, product is now in production and um, it's going quite well. So, but every now and again, I get asked for production support, which is, um, this is doing something funny. Can you can ha come have a look at it? And it's my job to work out why and what fixes we need to do for that. Or is it a laser problem? Is it something else? Get someone else to look at it type thing. Um, then uh, sort of more recently, uh, I was the lead laser engineer on TLB, which is a class 3B laser range finder. Um, so in terms of the laser engineering side of this, um, I took that product from the start um, of working with suppliers, um, no, sort, sorting our data pack. So by that, I mean, looking at all the the optics that we want, uh, well, they're all custom pretty much, and checking out what do the coating specs mean? Do they do what we want them to do? Um, especially for things like damage threshold, uh, working all that out, making sure we won't have a problem. And um, sort of de defining that, going to suppliers, not all the time that they can make what you ask for. So there's a, a bit of a um, back and forth of, do we really need this or um, can we live with this? And um, sort of getting that all sorted. Um, and then through procuring those items in, I, I was then the one that, that built the first lasers. And um, then I, I worked with production and um, taught their technicians how to build it. That was actually quite a, a valuable experience over the last um, sort of year, year and a half of doing that. I, I, I learned a lot through working with them, especially I, I was the one that wrote the build instructions as well. So um, what I thought might be quite clear wasn't quite clear to someone else. So by that back and forth, um, I, I learned a lot and sort of take that forward into um, future work of, of how to do that and of course in development you you get lots of problems the first time you build things and um, especially in, in in larger volumes than um, a couple units that you would normally use in, in prototypes so um, it was my job to find out what was wrong with that and sort it and fix it and um, now over the sort of last year that um, that product we've completed that order um, and uh, now waiting on the next. Um, so maybe like a year or so ago, uh, maybe just over a year ago, uh, I took on the extra low role in um, that product where I became the lead technical authority um, we call it the design authority in Talis, um, which because I was the, the I, not just a laser engineer in that job, really, I, I was sort of overlooking all the the aspects of um, system. I know a bit of electronics, not the I could design a board myself, but I know what the functions are doing and why they're doing it. The same as the software and the, the firmware and the mechanics of, I know how that all fit in together to make the end result. Um, so I took on that role with basically I oversaw anything um, and you're, as that I'm responsible for 
making basically making sure the product does what it says we do and um, with all the qualification things that I did making sure that is all adequate and um, that the evidence I have supports what we're saying and also safety is a, is a large priority of that um, making sure that what we're making is safe and and does everything it should do um, and yeah uh, now I'm I'm working on um, the LTDM which is a, a target designator so it's actually the same laser that's inside that that's also inside the, the TLV it's just now higher rep rate and higher energy um, so I'm currently working on that finding out where its limitations are what we can do to improve that uh, these products that we make have to work over a very large temperature range from minus 40 to plus 70 degrees so sometimes when you build something and it works perfectly at room temperature when you take it to ex temperature extremes you run out of puff or something else happens so you're a bit like oh and have to sort that out so that's a lot of what i'm doing at the moment a lot of fault finding um especially a lot of what i learned through the tlv really helped with that as well um the sometimes what you get from production is a sort of end result of what happened of all oh, this lost energy or something but really it could be a whole number of things which cause that to, to happen so you, you have to sort of develop a mindset of what does that actually mean step back and and sort of go and look into different regions and of why rather than jumping straight into something and maybe spending a lot of time or spending a lot of money and trying to fix the wrong thing and um, so you, you you learn a lot of that along the way. Um, so besides of the laser engineer stuff, I, I'm also the one of the deputy laser safety advisors on site. Um, so for that, uh, I do risk assessments. Um, one of the main things I do is write laser safety papers for the new products. Um, and I also have to look after the eyewear, inspect them, make sure that they're being used safely as well and that the right goggles are being used for the right products or uh, development tests and whatnot. Um, yeah, so um, what do I think of the, the benefits of working in industry and um, why did I choose coming here rather than uh, staying in academia really? The, a major part of that was actually the job security. Um, I, I didn't like the idea of short-term contracts in academia and um, whereas industry you don't tend to get that you get in and um, unless something horrific happens uh, hopefully uh, it's quite hard to get rid of you um, I, I, I like the the sort of impact in, in real life applications um, now that I've been there for six years I, I've seen products go from uh, initial development all the way through to being used by customers and it's it's quite nice to see that to know that you're actually working on something that will be used uh, whereas my PhD I mean it was nice I, I got nice papers out of it I, um, nice videos and things but um, I don't think anyone will have ever touch that again since I left um, and not likely to uh, and the career progression as well so I've had uh, multiple pay rises and um, sort of uh, um, gone up some steps in, in my career since joining which uh, is possibly a bit quicker than you would in academia not um, impossible but um, there's, there's definitely a much more steps that you can jump up and increase your your wage and whatnot through the way uh, I get to work on a variety of different projects so I kind of showed just the products there but, um, but really there's uh, a whole bunch of other things that I've taken part in um, like I, I've worked on drones and things like that completely nothing to do with the laser but um, just I had a bit of time I had and um, so you, you can kind of see what's going on and get and get get involved in different things which um, it's, it's, it's a bit less siloed really than if you're at a uni um, and professional registration is something that uh, Talis and um, 
other industries really sort of um, in, enforce really, not enforce, but um, they give money towards uh, getting, like they pay my membership fees and I'm also chartered with the Institute of Physics, so they've paid that um, and they, they give you mentoring and time to, to do this all as well, which is quite good. Um, and as, as also along with the sort of flexible working and um, other benefits that you, you get from, from working for a company as well. Um, time. Oh, sorry, I've kind of been, um, I, I do have some slides on what TALIS is, but I think I've kind of gone quite over my time already. Um, but yes, this was kind of just to say TALIS is a big company. If you don't know, it's um, lots of employees and uh, quite a large global presence. And also we spend a lot of money on self-funded R&D. Um, so it's, it's not just working on old things, we work on a lot of new things too. Um, and if you're interested in looking, then for graduate schemes, it's the top link and direct entry jobs is, is the bottom one. Um, so yeah, I'll just finish here. <laughs> Thank you very much, very much, Ashley, for the great talk. So it was really useful to have an uh, insight of what you're doing. And uh, so now it's open for questions. So I have a question. Um, what has been the most interesting uh, project that you've been part of in TELES? If it's okay for you to say it. <laughs> it's not like confidential. <laughs> yes, no, um, I, I think the sort of TLB, which was the class 3B laser range finder, um, that was the it, it was definitely the most difficult um, but uh, it's sort of like a looking back at it now um, the most rewarding as well um, a lot of things um, because, because it was one of the ones that I'd seen through from the start um, because I've been there a while now whereas um, projects take quite a few years to come um, and it, it was definitely what I learned the most on and and rewarding to actually see it finally working and out being used by customers and uh, all the little things that we were having issues with a year, two years ago fixed. Um, so that's, that's definitely the, the one that I'd pick. Sounds good. We also have a, another question. So what advice would you give to those whose project didn't go to plane as what happened to, to you? Yeah. Um, and we yeah, move on. Yeah, I would just say don't panic. Uh, a lots of times experiments don't go right or don't work out, but it's it's what you learn from them and and how, um, like at, at, in academia, probably most of the stuff that you will do won't work out in the end. Um, but you, you, what you learn from that is really important as well. Like a, a negative result's not always negative, um, mm -hmm. and so. I, I was quite lucky in the sense of I, I came from a really good group and we looked around and saw what else was there and what else we could do. And, and it was it was just um, sort of by chance that we picked some other fibres up and melted them in a fusion spicer really. And, and um, that's what created my project. But um, you're, you're not on your own as well when things go wrong. So uh, just don't panic really. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, how early do you reckon I should apply for a job with TELES with respect to finishing PhD? Similarly to you, I would be worried about being stranded without employment. Um, yes, yeah, so personally, I, um, I applied in the July, I think it was, and started in October. Um, there's, uh, because it's a defence company, there's um, some sort of security vetting that you have to go through first, which I think takes normally a month or two. Um, so that, that was kind of my time scale. I, th I think I could have started earlier. That was just what I gave because I was still in um, the postdoc at the time. Um, but yeah, a, a month or two is normally what it is between applying and starting. Yeah, thank you. And I guess if you're not a uh, UK citizen, that makes take a bit more time <laughs> to get this uh, done. Yes, possibly. Okay, thank you very much.